Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, we check out the new two models in the Specialized Epic, as well as some muck off inner tube sealant. Okay, now straight into news and over to Henry. So first up in the news this week is the new Epic and Epic Evo from Specialized. So the Evo name tag has traditionally been given to the more aggressive bike that shares a platform. So for instance, the Stump Jumper and Stump Jumper Evo, the Enduro Evo, and so on. And now we have the Epic Evo. So we're gonna go over the Epic first and we'll come back onto the more aggressive itineration in just a moment. So the Specialized Epic has been around for about two decades now, and it's always been really famous for having this brain system. Now, what is the brain? Well, basically it's an inertia valve. So basically when there's bumps that push the bike up, it essentially has a little spring-loaded um, inertia valve. So as that is transmitted through the bike, it pushes the string, spring into its stroke and opens the valve. So then you can get have damping, you can get wheel travel, but it doesn't open up for pedaling forces. So this is really, really good for XC racing where you want something that is compliant yet really efficient under power. So the Epic has still has 100 mil of travel and it's really perfect for those kind of either XC racing or Epic marathon sort of stuff. And this time, RockShox are making the brain system. Now over the years, it's gone between Fox manufacturing or RockShox and now it's RockShox again. So you get that hardtail efficiency with full suspension grip or, or so the theory goes. It's got revised geometry, which is a lot, you guessed it, lower, longer, slacker. And the reach goes from a 390 to 495, which is massive for an XC bike. It has a 67 degree head angle, 67.5 degree head angle, sorry, paired to a 75.5 degree seat tube angle. Although it's worth noting that on the small, it is slightly steeper to accommodate wheel travel. The Epic, starting at the comp model, starts at one pound under four grand. So um, pretty pricey, but it has always been a, a real racer's favorite, the Epic. So the Epic Evo, what's that about? Well, the first thing, as I alluded to earlier on, is it doesn't have that inertia valve. No brain on this, but it does look absolutely jewel worthy in this, this green with tan walls. It looks absolutely fantastic. So it has 10 mil travel extra out back, 110 mil, with paired to 120 mil fork. It has five sizes going from uh, extra small all the way to extra large with similar reach numbers. So the Epic Evo is meant to be kind of trail capable but XC weight. And I think it's really, really cool to have this kind of new wing of capable bikes. Now, dare I say it, it is a very down country. So apologies for that, but it does seem to be a real hot trend at the moment. Now, what do you guys think? Does your interest peak like mine does when you think about these really aggressive, super light, super efficient XC bikes that often just have a bit more travel and more aggressive numbers than you'd expect a few years ago? Let us know in the comments. Oh yeah, thanks for that, Henry. That Specialized Evo, wow. Um, that would definitely be the one I'd pick. Those town walls with the olive looking frame and um, essentially binning off the, the really efficient brain shock. I wouldn't need that for the sort of purpose of riding I'd have, but that'd be definitely the model I'd go for. I'd uh, love to hear from you guys. What would you prefer out of the two, the regular Epic or that Evo model? Uh, both very cool. Let us know in the comments underneath. Okay, so now it's time to talk about shoes. Now, Ride Concepts are back with another great set of shoes called the Vice. Now, just to refresh your memory, so Ride Concepts have been making flat pedal dedicated shoes and they've got their own rubber compounds. Uh, now these guys seemingly came from nowhere. We first checked them out I think about a year or two ago at one of the early Sea Otter events. Now their whole range of shoes staggered me really because of the fact they came from nowhere. I hadn't heard of them and they had a shoe for almost every application. And they've got three types of rubber kinetic soles that are exclusive to them. They've got the 4.0, the 6.0 and the 8.0. 8.0 is mid grip, 6.0 is high grip and 4.0 is max grip. Uh, obviously they're available in all sorts of different options. They use D3O in them for impact protection and actually they use them in the soles as well which is kind of interesting stuff. But their new shoe, bit of a departure from this style. They've gone for a bit more of a flat pedal style dirt jump shoe. And this is the Vice on screen. And it's available in a few different colorways and it's designed with Carl Strait actually. Um, so he's got loads of input to the shoe. 
So at a glance, they look a bit more like your regular skate style shoe, but they have been designed with mountain biking in mind, in particular dirt jumping, street riding, slope style. I mean, they've got lots of protection, but you've got to bear in mind that these are designed around that style riding as opposed to out and out pedaling. If, uh, if pedaling miles is what you're after, then perhaps you want to look at some of the other models like the TNTs or whatever. Um, but these ones are really cool. So the sole on them, look at this, right? So this is a new sole for them. Uh, it's called the Fusion Sole. It looks reminiscent of that sort of waffle sole you see on shoes like Vans, but this one is specifically designed for flat pedals. Now it's got a hexagonal profile to the holes on the sole and, it, and they're different in size as well, between seven and eight millimeters and some are deeper and some are shallower, all designed around hooking up on flat pedals. Now they use the mid formula of the rubber, the 6.0, Using it in this type of sole, I mean, I've got a pair here you can see. When you use it in this type of sole, the sole is more flexible so they can fall more and actually feel a lot more like a skate shoe. Except, unlike using like your favorite pair of vans to ride to the pub in, you don't get the old monkey feet. Like these things are actually really good for riding in. They've got a really good heel cup on them, a really protective toe cup. And as soon as you put your foot into them, you realize it's not just a pair of trainers. They are a genuine riding shoe. They just have the form of a pair of trainers. And uh, I think they look amazing. I think ride concepts have come a long way in not much time, to be honest. Uh, a few more rad shots on screen of them. Uh, a few more features. So they've got a rubber toe bumper, the gusseted tongue. They're available in a few colorways. There's uh, urban style battleship gray. There's black, there's a gun, gun rubber sole, the camo and blacks I've just shown you. They look really cool. And the coolest thing is they come in adult and kids versions. So the adult version are $100 or 100 euros, and that is about 89 quid in the UK. And the kids version, 65 quid in the UK, which translates 80 euros or 80 US dollars. I think those guys do an amazing job. Uh, anyone else out there used Ride Concepts? If so, what do you think of them? Let us know in those comments underneath. Back over to Henry. Garmin also have some new releases this week with the 130 and 1030 cycle computers. So the 130 has a 1.8 inch display which uses buttons and with the 1030 you go to a 3.5 inch which is a touchscreen. And the touchscreen is very clever because it works with gloves which is for cycling very important indeed. In fact it's the same system they use on the 830 and I'll be riding along and can use the Garmin with gloves but not my phone. So I don't know how they do it but it is very useful. So both use some of the same features, such as Climb Pro. This is where it will basically help you um, work out the length and how much work you need to put into the climbs and help you pace yourself on the climbs by telling you how long you got to go, the gradients which are coming up and the gradients which you've gone through. So I think it's really, really cool. They both can track vital performance insights like VO2 max, heart rate and recovery time. On my bike, I have the 830 paired to a parameter and the recovery time is really, really good because what it does is it gives you a really good indication of load. Now, if you're somebody like me, it makes putting your feet up on a rest day, you know, that much sweeter because you know you've done the work and your body is thankful for it. On the times you do push through, you'd be amazed how fatigued you feel the next day. So, so much technology goes into this to make it accurate. Both have incident detection and live track plus weather updates, and that's because you can link it to your phone. So that means you can also get your text message alerts and so on. Now the 1030 touchscreen is really, really big unit. So you might be thinking, what's the battery life? Well, the usable battery life, so when it's linked to the bike with GPS, etc., is 24 hours. And if that's not enough, you can actually get a bolt-on battery pack to extend that, I think, to about double. So it's really quite remarkable. So the 130 is kind of on the more entry level side and starts at 200 US dollars. Or the 1030, which is the real big daddy of the whole Garmin range, starts at 600 US dollars. And both are available in various bundles, etc. I absolutely love my Garmin. I've got the 830. And when I did the Everest ride last year, I think it still had like, they said it was 24 hour battery life, but it was a 21 hour ride and it still had about 40% left. So, I was very, very thoroughly impressed and it's great to, uh, to not have to worry about recharging it all the time. But yeah, that's uh, for those people that perhaps have an eye on training or just want to navigate their rides. But great to see new computers from Garmin. Okay, next up in news, although not a new product as such, is a new product range, a limited edition range, uh, from our friends over at Giro. Now, we've recently showed off their brand new top of the range helmet using the spherical MIP system. That was the manifest. Uh, in fact, there's a shot of it on screen at the moment. Now that, of course, is the absolute top in their range. 
But the Montaro is still an incredible helmet and probably is every man's helmet as such. Um, the helmet that most people end up using. It's got MIPS on the inside, it's got that XT2 antibacterial uh, padding there, which means you can you can leave it for weeks, basically in sweaty summers and it won't, won't start funking up too much. Uh, it's got the Rocklock Air, like a helmet retention system on the back. Of course, Shiro were the first company to have any sort of cradle style system on the back of helmets. Like they were the first with Rock, uh, Rocklock in the 90, nearly said rock shock for some reason uh, it's got the movable peak of course which you can get out of the way to put your enduro style goggles on there it's generally a really cool helmet and as you might have spotted this particular one has a rad colorway to it i mean just look at the detailing on it it looks amazing now this is part of the hironori yasuda range now yasuda was an incredible iconic Japanese designer behind some really unique patterns and a lot of it used to be in black and white as you might have noticed from the detailing on some of these products. Now they actually made a video all about this because this wasn't a product line designed to sell loads or to make loads of profit from. This was made entirely from the interest of some of the designers that work at Jiro who've been fascinated by his work for, for many, many years. And he actually refused them the rights to do this range several times before they actually finally got to meet and agree that it was a good idea as a collab. So there's a really good video. I'm gonna put a link to it in the description underneath this. It's really arty. It's very different for us to show off on GMBN Tech, but it just shows a different side of tech, how they're involving graphics and actually outside of the bike industry stuff. Really cool to see. Obviously, the Montara is an amazing helmet. It's a really good, strong helmet. It's got, like I said, it's got MIPS, it's got all the stuff in it you need to be safe. But it shows that they're doing these cool little capsule wardrobes. So you've got the gloves that go with it. You've got the Merino socks that you can tag in there. You've got the riding jersey, and of course you've got the riding shorts. So you can go to town. There's a few more shots on screen. So the pricing of that Montara helmet and that Yasuda range is 150 US dollars. Uh, it's gonna be similar in euros. The gloves are 25, the jersey is 60, the shorts are 100, and the Merino socks are 16. Now a very limited run, but there are loads of other great capsule wardrobes that might suit your bike and your taste a bit more in their sight. Okay, next up, Muckoff are back with another product from their seemingly endless range of products. Uh, this one actually, I think, has got a lot of miles, um, in particular of late. A lot of people have started dragging their bikes out of the shed, a lot of commuters and people aren't necessarily mountain bikers like you or us, but they're suffering from punctures nonetheless. And they might not be set up tubeless, which is of course where you would normally expect to see tire sealant. This stuff is designed specifically to put inside inner tubes. And I think we all know someone that can benefit from having something like this. So share that knowledge around. It's a slightly different formula and actually has corrosion inhibitors in it, which is uh, made me question it first. I was like, why have they put that in there? But it kind of makes perfect sense. So you think that someone that might just use their bike for commuting, they can get a flat tire from time to time. If you had tire sealant leaking out of that inner tube into the tire, arguably it could sort of corrode the rim and the spoke heads over time. But this has been designed for basically lack of maintenance. So it's a really good feature to have in there. Now, amazingly, they say this will seal holes up to four millimeters in an inner tube. So I've got to try that, but I need to borrow a bike from someone that's got inner tubes in because I'm tubeless on everything. That said, I know that Martin's got a very special bike he's building and it's got a fat bike wheel on the rear. Um, he'll probably tell you more about that bike, one of the bowheads. Um, and I'm not sure he can convert it to tubeless. So that might be the perfect opportunity for us to try this out. And I know he's been tearing up tires the way he rides that thing, um, but really interesting. So a few more detail shots on the screen. As you can see, it's the Muckoff style formulation in there. It works with Presta and Schrader valves and it's got a valve core removal tool built in and it's got an injector built in. As you can see me clumsily pulling out the top there so you can insert it straight into your inner tubes. I think that's a wicked idea if you're still running inner tubes. Perhaps you're forced to run inner tubes because you've got a fat bike or you've got a type of bike that doesn't allow for tubeless. That could be a great option for you. Uh, retails for £9.90 in the UK. That is £9.99 in US dollars and £11.99 in euros. So the last piece in the news this week is a bit of a hot take actually because it's something that just released just after we filmed the show last week, so we couldn't include it, but it is the new bikes from Santa Cruz and Juliana, so an update to 5010 and Furtado. So just to kind of run you through the specs, because they do look very cool, and I know we have a lot of Santa Cruz fans out there. So they have a lower link driven VPP, so aesthetically it looks very different to the previous generation, but now moves it in line to the Mega Tower, the Nomad, etc. So it comes in the C or the CC, so both are carbon options, 
and both available for the Santa Cruz or Juliana. But basically, the C is the kind of more entry-level one, and the CC is the super high-grade carbon fibre. The women's version, the Furtado, basically runs on the smaller sizes, so it starts smaller and only goes up to our medium, and it comes with, you know, women-specific contact points, so it's, it's going to be more comfortable. Interestingly enough, it has 27.5 inch wheels, and this is because it's an emphasis on fun. 130 mil of travel at the rear, paired to 140 mil on the front. So it does have a flip chip, but you can run it in as low as 64.5 degrees on those 27.5 wheels, so it should be a very capable bike indeed. And the last noteworthy thing that caught my eye is as you go up through the sizes, the chainstays grow by three millimeters. Now this basically helps balance ever increasingly long front centers by lengthening out the rear a bit. And it makes loads of sense because as you go up to the sizes, that front center is growing depending on the frame size. But often, you know, you can get the same size chainstays on a small as an XL. And that doesn't make much sense. So it's to kind of counteract that. Now, obviously for Santa Cruz and Juliana, this will incur more cost, but I think it's a really positive step and it's a step that more and more brands are taking. So I think it's really, really good news. But yeah, I think it looks great. So it'd be cool to, uh, cool to see them in the flesh at some point. They've got some fantastic colors. So now it is time for the quiz, which is where you get to test out your tech knowledge. So the first question, what is TPI? And do you know the difference between a low TPI and a high TPI? The second question, where did the 5010 name come from? So that's the name of the Santa Cruz bike we're talking about in the news that's just had a new version come out. And the third and final question, which bike has the longest name in the world? Very Jeremy Clarkson. But which bike is it? So you have to tune in later on with Doddy to find out those answers. And now it is time for Bike Cave. This is where we get to feature your bike caves. So what is a bike cave? Well, it's where you store your bikes, where you work on your bikes, etc. So if you do have your own submission and you want it featured upon the show, then get in the upload link below and fingers crossed we can feature it. So the first feature this week is from Martin in Norwich and he says he's finally finishing the extension to my garage and now he has a bike cave so it sounds it's been a bit of a work in progress. It's filling up with stuff quickly that he's been collecting over the years. There's a pool light of the workbench and the jukebox on the wall. You may also notice the BMX is on the walls and it, I mean you said you're filling up with stuff, it looks, looks pretty full. <laughs> But it's got loads of stuff. The actual workplace there looks pretty good. Got a little bench grinder, a vice, nice set of, nice, lovely set of drawers, you can see. <laughs> and yet yeah, really well lit. Loads of bikes and yeah, BMXs everywhere. There's something, people collecting BMXs isn't as niche as you thought it would be, or so bike caves would suggest. It seems a lot of people do. Clearly like your, um, your old school stuff with that uh, jukebox, all very cool. Looking pretty good indeed. So many BMXs, I wonder how you know, you even get started with that sort of thing. But yeah, very nice, Giant XTC as well, which is a pretty cool cross country bike as well. Nice, very efficient, light hardtail. And next we have Michael from Haddington in East Lothian. And this is his bike cave. And you can tell he's been lucky enough to get up to Fort Bill for the World Cup a few times, just from some of the, uh, some of the posters, etc. Clearly a Steve Pete fan, which is pretty cool. Maybe he's done some racing there himself, which is rad. And I love ones like this, very light. And I always say it, but it just means, you know, you can really see what you're doing, but you do have to contend with mud getting on the walls. But if that doesn't bother you and it doesn't really bother me, then just perfect. And it looks, Great there, Michael. So the next one is from Willem. And he just says he's so happy to have his new bike after waiting for it for two months. So we're hearing a lot about this recently with obviously the pandemic, you know, bikes being delayed. Are any of you guys, you know, suffering from this? I imagine it's very frustrating, but apparently the shops are just, well, they're selling like hotcakes, aren't they? And we have another submission from Gregory. And so basically he was just saying he got home 
from deployment in the US Navy. And it sounds like his wife decided to surprise him with loads and loads of bike paraphernalia for him getting home. So we've got tools, we've got, he says he's got some helmet, some goggles, all this sort of stuff. And I think it's just super cool. And those ghosts, really interesting bikes. We actually got to look at um, Thomas Slavic whilst we're out in Chile. I believe he's riding one of those. And well, his doesn't look quite as smart with the tan walls, which definitely helps. But all in all, a really nice workspace. I think you'll agree. Got that new workstation there to organize everything. And yeah, able to get it all laid out on the workbench because that for me is absolutely vital. Now guys, like I said, if you have your own bike cave, please do submit it and hopefully we can feature it on the show. Thank you very much. Okay, now it's time for Rewind, where we take a trip back to yesterday, where all the cool stuff that we ride now came from. It all had to start somewhere, which meant some hilariously bad stuff, and some stuff now that actually is so sought after, it is ridiculous. Uh, now, first up this week, we're gonna jump straight in with this giant ATX. So, this isn't strictly retro, I guess it's kind of, it was in the 90s, I guess, towards the end, but uh, man, look at this thing. So the Giant ATX-1 was the downhill frame developed in conjunction with Rob Warner. Now an interesting fact about this frame is that John Tomac was also riding on Team Giant at the same time as Warner, but he chose to not use that. He wanted to use Intenses and other branded frames uh, with Giant decals and stuff on. He didn't actually use this frame, but Warner used it very successfully and it was a really popular frame for good reason as well. Like modern day giant frames, incredibly good value for money, robust, great warranty, and it worked well. I tell you what, it does look bloody good, doesn't it? Are they Boxer 151s? I don't think they are. Um, maybe, I can't tell. I can, did they have the red crown on? I think they might have done. I'm sure if uh, Jamie Lynn's watching this, he'll be the quickest one to correct me. So that's got the original Bergtech stem on it. It might be uh, marked up as Goldtech stem, in fact. Uh, it closer resembled a brick than it did a stem compared to that lovely stem that they've just uh, released. That I've seen the 50 to 1 boys are all riding. Looks awesome. A massive Tioga saddle on there. Uh, Hope brakes, are they the, they're the, o no, they're the C2s, aren't they? Because they've got the little dial on the O2s with the open ones. Um, as in open system or closed system, that was the difference between them. The ones with the dials on the top, as they pump up um, on your run, you could sort of undo the dial to sort of counter that. Whereas the, the open systems used to sort of compensate for that. Uh, much like more modern brakes do, to be honest. Now it's, um, it was a faux bar system, so it had, it looks like a four bar linkage in the way that the shock is actuated, but it's actually got a seat stay link on it as opposed to a chain stay link, which would have made it a four bar, but it worked amazing. So it's essentially a single pivot uh, linkage activated. Massive pivots on them, I've kind of forgotten to be honest. Huge old pivots, they used to come with, I think the choice of having an AC chain guide with them, but I see you've got the Goldtech one on there. Uh, Goldtech was a really premium brand in the UK. They're still around today, but you'll probably know some of their other products as Bergtech, uh, which they sort of merged into, but Goldtech, the company, the stuff they used to make is phenomenal. Yeah, really cool to see. So it's a sprung, almost a jockey cage on the lower there. There's no way that chain was coming off. And then the alloy plate on the top. They reminded me a bit of the uh, old Rooks chain dog and chain cat type devices that were around back then. Looks like a regular Calloway seat post on there. Uh, the Tioga factory tires, Mavic SUP rims. Man, that looks awesome. Great bikes. And next up is another giant. Wow, so this one's from Cameron in Charlotte. Um, the geometry for this bike is surprising what you see on modern trail and enduro bikes. I can totally believe that. That was a super popular frame as well. Another frame raced very successfully by Rob Warner, nonetheless. I'm not sure if Tomac rode that one, probably not. It sounded like Tomac was a bit tricky back then, wanted to do his own thing, but, uh, but hey, he's the GOAT. I see him up there, greatest of all time in my eyes. Um, I'd like to make a video with him. He's that incredible what he's done. I've added firmer coils in the fork and I've reduced the travel to 170 so I can ride it more like an all mountain bike. I replaced one firm coil with a medium one and it's ready for the bike park. Great fun for an 18 year old bike that's still got life left in it. Dude, I bet it's amazing still. Hey, you could put a dropper post on that and you probably could ride it up hills. In fact, it's a pretty good idea for a video there. Hold that thought. What else have we got? Oh, look at this. Wow, so author, this one is from R in Maryland, USA. So light speed owl hollow hardtail. Wow, look at this thing. Made from 325 alloy, uh, titanium alloy that is, uh, and 64 tire alloy. Full XTR, three by eight drivetrain, XTR V brakes with old tech levers. Those things are amazing, they're so rare. Um, well, certainly rare in my world. <laughs> I know there might be some collectors out there that have got dozens of them. 
Synchros crank stem and seat post. That Synchro stem was one of my favorite all time mountain bike products. I used to love the fact it had the sort of the uh, enclosed design there clamping onto the steerer tube and then the sort of the swing clamp on the front. Beautiful thing. Uh, world class BB, tie tech, tie handlebar, flight saddle, ringlet hubba bubba wheels with ringlet, uh, with specialized tires and Rockshaw's Judy SL fork and a Chris King headset. Dude, that thing is dripping in the most ridiculous spec. Wow. Look at the condition of it as well. It's even got Onza L bend bar ends on there as well. And not the cheap ones too, they're the decent ones. So I used to do the chrome Molly ones, which uh, me and my mates used to buy because you wanted the look. But the alloy ones are the ones you went for, or the titanium ones if you're a team rider, but no one could afford those. Super nice. Yeah, XTR Mech, you got the alloy jockey wheels on there. Those are synchro cranks, they look so good. Original XTR M37, 737 pedals as well. Um, XT, if I thought it said XTR. I'm on a bit of a retro trip here. Something's gone wrong with my head. Man, look at that thing. Classic looking light speed frames, beautiful. If anyone out there's not ridden a titanium bike, if you ever get the chance, in particular, try a titanium hardtail. There's something about it. Anyone that's ridden one will tell you the same thing. Nothing quite feels the same. So alloy frames can feel really responsive, but can feel quite harsh. And then chrome molly frames can feel, have a little bit of a springy nature, but they can feel quite dead at times. Whereas tyres sit somewhere in the middle where you've got a slightly springy forgiving feel, but it feels really snappy as well. And the great thing about titanium is you never need any paint on it because it doesn't corrode. So it will look that good forever. Just amazing. And in fact, my daily commuter bike, when I used to commute to work, uh, it's currently locked up, um, is titanium. And that's not painted and it still looks as beautiful as the day I got it. But uh, awesome, thank you R for sending this in. Um, wow, really nice to see. Great stuff, uh, some great trips down memory lane there. Thank you everyone for sending in your rewind entries. If you have a 90s mountain bike or any sort of mountain bike gear or memorabilia, we would love to see it. There's a link right there and there's another one underneath this video and you can click on. Uh, hopefully we can go back in time again next week. See you later. Now it is time for Top Mods. Now this is where we get to showcase all your hard work. So we have submissions like this week, which is kind of more thorough, but it doesn't always have to be that way. We've had loads of variety. We've had people spraying their bikes, you know, roaring up their frames. We've had people just making some very tidy adjustments. But this week is something very nice indeed. So it's from I hope I don't butcher the name, Diwa. I'm gonna say Diwa, sorry if I've um, messed that up a bit, from Uppsala in Sweden. And he's saying he bought his first entry-level mid-travel bike with ambitions to learn more about tech and mechanic to upgrade over time. And boy oh boy, has he been doing the upgrades. So he's done loads of work, and I mean loads of work. And seeing the end results, it looks fantastic. So we've got, you know, different forks, different shock he said he's done all the pivots he's done the bottom bracket the brakes everything really and the end result well it looks very very smart indeed so uh, thank you very much for sending that in to us and uh like i said guys if you have your own bike you want featured on here next time you're doing some work on it just tell us what you did in the job why what you're thinking what your plan was and how well you you feel you executed it and um yeah Tell us a bit of a, paint us a word picture and hopefully we can feature it on the show. So this week, actually, I'm gonna sneak in a little top mod of my own. Now I should say it's not as impressive as this Lapierre, but hopefully it will help some of you. So I always like to ride with glasses, but it's always handy to have a storage option on your helmet. Now putting them in my helmet, they did stay in, but maybe not, not massively secure, especially if I forgot to put them back on and I was riding a, like a traversing tech section or something like that. So I put some small bits of rubber mastic tape just on the side there, just to increase the, um, the width a bit and also something very, very grippy for the legs to cling onto. And now, I mean, they're, they're pretty secure. They're not going anywhere. They just rest on the visor there and um, it really, really helps me. And I thought maybe it would help some of you as well. So yeah, just two, two small slices of rubber mastic tape which you normally put on your chain stays. And yeah, I haven't had them come out. I always leave them up there, I've ridden some pretty, some pretty tech trails and yeah, never have any issues. So I'm um, quite happy with that. And it just um, stops the bugs getting my eyes and whatnot. So maybe you'll find that useful as well. 
All right, now we're back with the quiz answers. Did everyone play? Did anyone get the right answers? Did anyone cheat? Did anyone use their phones? Hopefully you didn't. Okay, so the first question Henry asked was, what is TPI? And do you know what the difference is between a low TPI and a high TPI? Anyone get it? There's been some clues in tire videos recently. It stands for threads per inch, and it's the amount of threads the carcass has per square inch. Now you get a low TPI, maybe 60, and you'll get a high one, maybe 120. Of course, it varies on brands and styles of tire. Now, for a long time, a low TPI has been seen as a cheap tire and a high TPI has been seen as a high-end tire, but it's for differing reasons. It's not what you might think. So on a low TPI rate, uh, the threads tend to be a lot bigger, a lot thicker. So it's easier to make the tire because of that. But the downside is you don't get much in the way of feel. So the tire is cheap, so you can make good budget tires out of it and they're gonna be effective and nice and solid. But the casing is gonna be kind of quite thick and not that conformative uh, over terrain. But it makes for excellent downhill and heavy duty tires because of that exact reason. The downside to it is they can be heavier and because of the fact it doesn't deform at all, uh, it doesn't deform as much as a higher TPI tire, they can roll a lot slower regardless of the rubber compound that they're used. Now a higher TPI, is made of much thinner strands, much closer together. Now, even at a higher pressure, you can have a tire that conforms more to terrain, which is why you tend to see XC racers still running higher tire pressures in general. It is lowering as tire technology changes, but I could easily run 32 PSI on my super thin cross-country tires, which are 120 TPI, and they still deform plenty enough underneath me. It could go lower, but then I start, because I'm quite a heavy rider, um, about 90 kilos, in case you're wondering, I start deforming the tire around. So uh, that's why that option works really well for that. Um, well, there you go. Next up, he asked, what or where did the 5010 uh, logo come from Santa Cruz? This is quite a cool story, actually. Did anyone get this? When the bike was launched, it used to be called the Solo, not the 5010. And rumor has it, um, could have been something to do with a Hollywood name in a certain Star Wars film. Um, also, because of NGC 5010, a certain uh, lenticular galaxy uh, constellation out there. Um, but maybe they just changed it because they had to change it and Solo was as close as I could get to um, uh, 5010, which is why they used 5010. There you go. Next one, and this is a really fun one. Which bike has the longest name in the world? This is easy, I love telling this story. Anyone get it? It's a beach cruiser by Kona called the Huma Huma Nuka Nuka Apua. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce the name. And that is a trigger fish uh, from Hawaii. Of course, a lot of Kona's names, the Kilauea, the Lava Dome, the Syndicone, the Explosive, they're all themed around Hawaii and mountainous volcanoes and stuff. Uh, the original bike called the Humu Humu Nuku Nuku Apua is now in a range called the Humu Humu. Um, when they launched that bike, it was a beach cruiser with that twin style top tube. It was the bike with the longest name in the world. But another brand, I forget what the brand is, they launched a bike and it had like another two letters. So Kona were like, well, we're not having this. So they launched another bike and they called it the Humu Humu Nuka Nuka Apua Deluxe. And that name took up the entire top tube. No jokes, look it up on Google, it's still out there somewhere. Um, so they won clearly because the name takes up the whole top tube. Uh, and for, for the record, I'm after one. I'm after a frame and a fork to build up as a pub bike. So if anyone knows of a Humu Humu Nuka Nuka Apua Deluxe going, I would love to take your armor for that one. Uh, and there you go. A bit of random pub knowledge for you. And that is it for another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Thank you very much for watching. Now guys, what do you think of that specialized Evo? Because we're at a junction, we're gonna to have to really get behind this down country thing or indeed get some kind of swear jar mechanism so we stop yammering on about it so much. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.